All right, just a reminder, we're in week three, not quite halfway, so that would be this week. So uh, we are, there's a lecture today and there will be a lecture on Wednesday. Um, and that is the KSP stuff. So today the study set is titrations and then there will be the next study set will be Wednesday and Thursday. Um, we're going to have a talk on Wednesday with the lecture is going to be on Thursday. So anyway, tomorrow is class presentations for most of you, which will be during your regular time. And then there's a handful of you going today. So there's no office hours until six o'clock today. So I won't have office hours at five. Um, so I guess that's what I want to talk about. So we're lecturing now and then I will stay after for like a half hour or so. Um, but I will have to leave at three thirty today just so I can finally get a chance to eat breakfast. Um, but those of you presenting today, it's from four to six. And then, so I don't have five, I won't have office hours for um, those of you here who often come at five. Um, I, I will be on at six or a little bit before six to go over the study set. And then I will stay on until eight o'clock. If you have questions on your worksheet, um, that's due tonight. All right, so we're starting a new topic, which is why I get to be the rainbow squid. Um, which made my son like stop. He came to ask me a question and he just stopped and walked away and then came back. And I'm like, guess what I'm talking about? So on Wednesday, when we finish, do the other half of this, you can dress up as a mermaid or a fish or whatever you want, or you can just participate in class. Um, so this is really not as much about solubility as what's precipitating or both of them. Um, and back in chemistry 221, you learned how to write double displacement reactions and we did like gas forming and you remember the double displacements and one type was called a precipitation reaction. And we learned how to knock out the spectator ions. Well, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at those precipitates. So there was a chart that I am sure anybody who did not have me, they the chart was, I may have even given to those of you who are with me, and some people love those charts. Um, we're working with a different chart now, and so if you printed your notes, like half of the notes are charts this time because we're going to be looking at all those things that those other charts in 221 said were not soluble because that was a lie. Everything in 221 seems to be a lie except the periodic table, beautiful. Um, even that has mistakes to it. And that is that all the things that we would say are not soluble that form a precipitate, it turns out they have a little bit of solubility, just a little bit. So we're gonna be looking at those. The key to doing this is you're gonna always first write an equation and the equation's gonna look just like this one. So back in 221, or if you look at one of those charts, barium, barium, if you look on your periodic table over here in my orange, it's in the two A's. And what's the name of the family? The two A family, what do we call them? Earth metals. They are earth metals. Earth means solid. They're common in the earth because they form solids. And so they're always precipitating. We always write, the key to doing this is you always start with the precipitate. That's just my abbreviation for precipitate. And we're gonna go to the aqueous. So this is gonna be the solid side and the other side's the aqueous, which means soluble. Now, when we write our KSP, which is the values given in the appendix, what do we never ever include in a KSP? Solids and liquids. Yeah, who said that? One. I don't know why I can never get your voice. I don't know if it's, I've, yeah. All right, uh, so we don't include the solids. So we need it to write our balanced equation. The other thing is you are gonna have coefficients um, the solid is always one, but we'll see as we go through other ones. So we would write our KSP for this equation is just going to be always the products. So the barium showing the charge 
inside, so the barium's a plus two, and the sulfate ion. There is only one of each ion, so we don't need any exponents. KSPs are always small. They are always less than one. They're usually really small. If you look at the chart, some of them are like 10 to negative 20, 10 to negative 30. Um, they're kind of ridiculous numbers, which means, well, what would a number 10 to negative 12 mean? You all know, and K is less than one. Uh, reactant favored? It's reactant favored. So in terms of this, if the reactant is always the solid, you have mostly solid. And so that's why you learn that in 221. You're like, yeah, it's just not soluble. Very little dissolves. So you're going to have very little of the aqueous, which is the ions. All right. Um, so we're going to practice the key to doing every problem that you're going to do. Um, and by the way, the the, this week's folder for week three, I split into two folders. Um, so basically, I looked at today and tomorrow, which uh, as what was available to you. And then today, I think in like 10 minutes, all the KSP study sets and stuff will appear. That way, it was kind of in a separate place because mostly you have, to, you have to get through your presentation and paper first. That's that's a big hump. That's worth a lot of points. Um, so the key is you always, and I also wanted to get this piece out, you need to always first write the equation and then write your KSP expression. And then it's really easy to do the math. So calcium phosphate, anybody know what's the formula gonna be? I'll give you a moment. Look at your charges. CA, CA4, two. CA what? CA3, PO4, oh. two. Holy moly. The birthday boy is like on one. I almost kind of think he gets a second bonus for that. I'm impressed, Major. Uh, and that has to do with the ion. So calcium is a plus two ion and phosphate is a negative three. So uh, your polyatomics, um, well, yeah. There's not much I can control here. So normally there's a periodic table I give out and it has the five big ones on it, which is the phosphates, the nitrates, uh, carbonate. Yeah, Nick the camel and his friends, chlorate. Um, but phosphate, we're gonna see a lot and sulfate. So you'll probably know it. And to balance those charges, we need three calciums and two phosphates, right? So overall it's neutral. So uh, double arrows. So it's the one shortcut you can do, always solid to ions. The one piece that you can leave out if you like, because your teacher is going to do this, is I just leave out the word aqueous every time, because you have to show the charges as ions. As a solid, we don't show charges because it's all together as a compound. And then we're going to write the KSP expression. So normally I write smaller and I, you'll see me do this on the next one, um, like chromium three hydroxide. Oh, what's the Roman numeral three mean? Has a charge of three. Yeah, it has a charge of plus three. It means the chromium is a plus three. Hydroxide is a minus one. So what's gonna be our formula, Paul? You're muted. He's muted. I can see his lips moving. Oh, chromium, OH, uh, three of them. Yeah, and then just make sure you have parentheses yeah. and the threes on the outside. And you must always say solid. That's important because back to that question, some I think Juan answered, we don't include solids in our KSP. So you write your solid getting your subscripts correct. And then the subscripts become the coefficients. So just one chromium and three hydroxides. So we wanna always state our equation, solid to aqueous. And then we wanna write our KSP expression, which is, we always ignore the solid here. And the ions, 
show them as ions, so chromium. The three now becomes the superscript or the exponent, so OH to the third. And for the calc, this one, we would write KSP. Um, I usually write it as one line and all right. Uh, so calcium with a plus two, but it's the three on the outside as the exponent and the phosphate squared. And that's the key to all of these. You're going to see me doing all of these. Um, a quick note, I grabbed a set of notes uh, that I had left over from three years ago, actually. And I'm pretty sure most of it's the same. But if I start doing a problem that you guys don't have, somebody please speak up before I get too far into it. Um, so that's the key. Now, here's a question. Worthy of going up on the board, right? So what ions are always aqueous? and never ever part of KSP. They're always spectators. There's a reason I get to have Nick help me teach this class. He's the co, the TA. It's water one? Water's not an ion. Oh, right. So, but thank you for bringing that up. So water, we never show it in any of these. The term aqueous means they're dissolved in the water. So maybe none of you know yeah, this. How is, are they the house? <laughs> The opposite side, so the 1As, sodium, potassium, hydrogen, acids are always aqueous, and that is because of the hydrogen. So these guys are always aqueous. So they're always spectators. We're not going to see them in the precipitate. In fact, let's go look at that chart. So the chart drives me crazy, as does the chem room at school, because silver is under silver, not AG. So most of us at this point in our chemistry experience, we think of silver as AG and it's not under AG. But if you look for sodium, which will be under S, or potassium under P, there is no sodium. There is no potassium. There is no lithium KSPs because they always dissolve. So KSP is telling you how much dissolves. If they had a KSP, what kind of value would it be? It would be ginormous. It would be larger than one. It would be bigger than the Avogadro's number. It would be huge. Look at all these KSPs. They're all really small. What KSP is telling you, sorry, KSP tells you how much dissolves. Now, the way we know that goes back to the question I asked Juan, or that Juan answered correctly, we don't include the solid. KSP does not tell you how much precipitates because the solid's not part of KSP. We need it to write our balanced equation, but it's not there. All we see is how much dissolves. These KSP values in there are really small. So these guys are always, K these guys are always spectators, so there's no KSP. Um, today, we're not going to run into them. Wednesday, we will. And so anytime we see sodium or potassium, we ignore them. Uh, so those are cations because they're positive. What about the onions? You may know, that's why Nick's here. You may remember, Nick? Nitrate? It's so sad because you you like all like are online and nobody had to learn anything. All right, so nitrate. If you don't know the formula for nitrate, this is nitrate, not nitrite, something totally different. Well, not totally, but nitrate's always a spectator. If you go back and look at the chart, even strontium, barium, the heavy earth metals, iron, they don't have anything with nitrate. Nick is always a spectator. There's a couple others too, um, but 
that's like good enough for what we're doing. Um, there's like a whole chart that talks about these things. All right. So everything does dissolve. It's just a really small amount. We're talking less than a grain. So if you take like a whole thing of, of salt, um, and that's what this picture here is showing that we dump it in there and it's pretty much all showing up as solid. There would be a wee amount. That's actually is ions in there. There's a couple of ions floating around. So it does actually conduct electricity just really, really weakly. Not like if you took table salt. All right, so we'll do silver chloride. And this is where we have to pretend like it's the good old days and you didn't get the chart. And so you have to do it based on the information I have. So you're always going to start by writing your formula. Now, something about silver, silver likes to always be a plus one. Um, that's not actually 100% true, but it's enough ingrained in there that we usually think of silver as a plus one. Um, usually I put a the Roman numeral with it. And then chloride is the IDE ending means we're not dealing with the polyatomics. Um, you guys have nice charts. So even if you never learned how to name, you could always go and find silver and that would help you to get your formula. Um, and unfortunately you have Google, but there are time limits to what we're doing. And you know, using your own brain cells is helpful. As is not taking yourself seriously. It's really fun to dress up like a rainbow squid. All right. So silver ion plus chloride ion. Show the solid to the ions. Ions must have charges. Date your KSP. That's really 90% of the lesson we're learning today and Wednesday. If you get there, now the rest, we just have to analyze. So the rest is the part that will just be different. So what does the term saturated solution mean? It means it can be, be, um, be dissolved or it can have- It, it can is have dissolved. Impression. It means the most that you can have is dissolved. This could this is probably technically a saturated solution. It means as much as what we'll say barium sulfate as can be is dissolved and the rest is precipitating. So this is the concentration of the solution, how much is dissolved. That is your silver and that is your chloride. So basically these guys must each be 1.34 e to negative five. That's it. So we'd plug them into there because that is what our KSP is. And we get a number. All right. I got 1.8. I don't know why I have only two sig figs. I do know why I only have two. E to negative 10. We're in that ballpark. Why don't we just punch it in for the heck of it to have more? Oh, so 1.80. So if you want to go with the three sig fig rule, um, a comment, if you look at those charts at the back, KSPs are like KAs and KBs. They're serious hand waving. Oh, that's the tree guys across the street. They're killing the tree across the street from me. I'm like crying here because my neighbor next door has killed all of his trees and now they're taking out this ginormous tree that's been there like for a hundred years and all right so i'm dressed as a rainbow squid to ignore them um but they're approximates we have to use the chart in here otherwise you're going to have different ksps than me um the other thing i want to point out there is also another page, the very last page, 
is not KSP, it is KF. And we're gonna talk about that on Wednesday. So that's something very different and we'll worry about that. So just be careful. All right. Um, but if you wanna go with the three sig fig rule for everything we're doing, that's fine. We get a negative exponent, we move on. Uh, this one wasn't part of our notes. So strontium fluoride. Strontium's a really cool ion. That was the one several of you said that they analyzed bones from uh, the ancient Romans in that one movie and they could tell how much meat they eat. So somebody's going to analyze your bones in a thousand years and know what your diet was based on the strontium content. All right, what's the formula? SRF2. SRF2. And that is because strontium is one of those earth metals. It likes to form solids. So plus two and then two fluorides. Now, back to a comment from earlier. It wasn't this, but somebody mentioned the word halogens. No diatomics. No diatomics. They're going to show up after celebration two, which, by the way, is next Monday. Um, so that's in a week. A lot happens between now and then, as we have all noticed in the past year and a half. Um, don't don't go to diatomics with any of this. We're not dealing with liquid gases. We're dealing with aqueous. All right. State your KSP formula. So strontium ion, and then F negative squared. So the two has moved up there. Um, so this is something that Dr. Cohen would do and, and it intrigued me that, and you may have noticed on the last celebration that I kind of made up a compound named Hot Diggity Dog. I, that, that could happen on the next celebration. And if you've been doing the work, then you'll be able to figure out how to do the formula. So sometimes I make up things because of this unfortunate thing where people like to use Google. Um, so do your own work and then it won't be a problem. All right, what units do we have to be in? To plug in the K. Molarity, so you must use molarity. So I'm gonna show you a really cool trick. Oh, good, it works here. I, I've said this like three times before, and then I'm like, oh, never mind, because um, I changed the problem. So I'm gonna show it to you. It shows up a lot in uh, this stuff. So what the units for molarity are? Uh, moles per liter. Moles per liter. They all said in units in. Hey, that's good. We're getting more responses here. Moles per liter. So technically, we have to change milligrams to grams and milliliters to liters. There's another trick. Those of you who've been with me, I've shown you this before. If you have a milli over a milli, you can cross the millis out if you don't want them. Um, if you have a micro over a milli, you can't do that, but it's the millis cancel. You can also work it out and see that it would cancel out. So all we have to do is change our grams to moles. You will need to show your those little setups and you will need to show me this number. So if you're using like an online calculator and saying, what is this answer gonna be? Oh, you're gonna have to have some work shown. Use your periodic table. You add up the strontium and the two fluorides. So, right, that's what that 87.62, go with three sig figs. Fluorides are 19. This is like around 125.6 grams on the bottom, one mole on top. You get some number here. That your teachers have to figure out that number. Okay. You're gonna notice we're gonna have a lot of small numbers with KSP. So 8.76 e to the negative four. 
That's my moles per liter. That's of this compound. This is where the stoichiometry comes in. That is your strontium. How much fluoride do you have? You have double that number. So if we double it, I'll show you another trick on the next page that some people actually like that better. So I'll write it up here. So my fluoride is going to be 1.75 e to negative 3. So the strontium comes out as that because it's the same as the strontium fluoride. Um, I didn't have to do that up here with the silver chloride because it was a one-to-one -one mole ratio, so they were both the same. So basically, this is X, which was this number, and this is 2X. Now, not only did I have to double the fluoride, I'm going to have to square it when I plug in here. So this is my strontium number. And again, I'll, I, I, I'll write everything up above. So the 8.76 e to negative 4. You can leave units out, but I'll write them underneath to make sure we got it. And 1.75 e to negative 3. And if Devin's listening to this, he's like, why don't you just do that trick? I'm going to teach you another trick on the next page. Um, you should get a really small number because we're working with negative exponents. So I got 2.69 e to negative 9-ish. All right, let's talk about the exponent is the key. I'm going to be looking at your first two digits. So as long as we're around 2.7, if you want to go with two sig figs, this is our KSP, no unit, because it would be molarity cubed, which would be really bizarre. Any questions from this first page? It's on that 1.75 number, it's from the chart, right? Where did you get the number? The 1.75? Uh -huh. I doubled this. You just doubled that, okay. Yeah. So thank you for asking. Think of this as x. Let's call it x to make it simple that this is 2x because of the 2. And that's going to become more apparent on the next page. Um, yeah. Thank you for that question. All right. Next page. So what we just did is given the solubility, how much dissolved, we're going to now move into given the KSP, we're going to find how much dissolved. So first step you're going to do. Anybody? What's the first thing you're going to do for every one of these problems? Captain Where's America. Write the equation. Thank you, Sumner. Write your that was, equation. That was Peter. That was Peter. Oh, that was Peter. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Um, write your case equation and write your KSP. All right. All right, Peter and Paul are up there, Perry. That would be next. So Peter, Paul, and Perry have to always be up there. I've been telling everybody about this famous trio that's in my class. So I know it's CAF2. That's the periodic table that your calcium solid you must show the solid. And then we go to calcium two and two fluorides. And then you state your KSP. You can show it as brackets or you can use parentheses. You must show it as ions. Let's respect that they're ions. And this is just F negative. The two becomes the exponent. So I know the KSP, so I can plug that in. You guys always know the KSP. You're going to use the chart. Again, you have to use the one in the notes because they vary depending on the website you look at. So that way we get the same numbers. So 3.9 e to the negative 11 equals 
or times 10 to negative 11. That, that's your preference, how you like to show that. So we don't do mice charts. We do really abbreviated charts. These guys, if this is X, this must be 2X. This holds true today. I was nice to myself today um, because all I have is calcium fluoride. Until I start mixing them from outside, starting with something different, these guys are always stoichiometrically related. So it's just saying, hey, all we have is calcium fluoride. So I have an X amount of this. I have two X of that. So you're going to plug it in as X and two X. And the two X gets squared, not the X the two and the x. So this is 4x cubed. We run into 4x cubed a lot because a plus two charge is by far the most common charge of cations, by far. Uh, and especially ones that precipitate. It's not the only thing we'll see, but now you solve for x. So. Divide by the four, and you'll have to take a cube root. Once you get to x, x is going to be what units? Polarity. Moles per liter. And I want you to solve for grams per liter. All right, try it. Pause this. If you're watching, pause. All right, I'm going to resume recording. So. The algebra, again, you're going to, this comes out, both of these come out as a 4x cubed, but um, you would divide by the 4 and then take the cube root. If you don't know how to take the cube root, you can also do, because um, my calculator or my brain, how I think of it, you take it to the one third power, and that's how you isolate x. So my KSP divided by four, and then I raise it to the one third power. Um, so we should get this number, which I just keep in my calculator. Again, that is moles per liter. That is of the calcium technically, but that is also the calcium fluoride because it's one mole of each. So we can think of that as the calcium, fluor sorry, the calcium fluoride. Um, so whenever you go to grams, this is something that was happening on the worksheet, the titration stuff um, and the buffer stuff. Whenever you go to grams, it has to be the whole compound. Um, and so it is the calcium and the fluorine. So this should be around 78 or 78.1 grams per mole. Um, we're doing the three sig fig. So you can keep more than that, especially if you're Kobe, or you can go with three-ish sig figs. Uh, our answer should be 0 0.0167 grams per liter. What did I give as the answer? You gave it in milligrams, so it's great. Perfect. Yeah. So that's great. what I wanted. That's what I was hoping I did. Thank you, Perry. Um, so you're going to see it written in many of these places. It starts showing up somewhere that I'm going to say, report the answer. I'll say sulfur or sulfur solubility in grams per liter, but report the answer to the most appropriate metric unit. And you'll see it. Um, oops, most appropriate metric unit. And that means let's get rid of let's move our decimal point instead of this 0 0.00 or 0, 0.0. So recognizing you could go to centigrams actually. So 1.67 centigrams per liter, but it's feeling more comfortable. Or sometimes I ask you to do it in milligrams per liter. So we would have one more step. So if um, anyway, that's why I did it in milligrams because I would have divided um, or I would have said either a thousand milligrams per one gram or 10 to negative three grams on the bottom and one milligram. Um, over this next week, hopefully you get more comfortable with metric. If you're not, and if you don't, if you, however you've been doing metric, you should have that chart handy because we're going to see the metric unit show up a lot this week. All right, uh, this compound, 
is not a, not one of those regular ions that you see. So this is indeed copper two, but this is what's called, so this is copper two azide. And it should have made you think, what, does she have a typo there? Uh, nitrogen, three of them come together and there's a charge left over. And so technically this oxidation state would be negative one third for each nitrogen. It doesn't make sense. This thing blows up. It's gonna blow itself apart. It's extremely explosive. It's in every airbag. It's actually sodium azide that's in the airbags in your car um, because it is so sensitive just to tap to it. And the thing becomes nitrogen N2 uh, gas and your earbag, this happens in a femtosecond. It takes for your brain to know the accident happened a nanosecond because our a little bit slower. Um, and for the actual like movement by Newtonian physics, I think we're at milliseconds. So a thousand times slower than that. Um, but yeah, when you look at a compound like that, your brain should be like, that's really weird. And it is, but it's really useful. You all are too young to remember when the first airbags came out and the shopping cart would like barely tap a car and airbags would go off. And so they, they've done stuff to make it work better. All right, so X and 2X, write your KSP expression also with the ions shown as ions, N3 with the negative squared on the outside, and then you set it up 6.3, however you write it, uh, equals our 4X cubed. I do not need to see the algebra like I was showing here. You can show it. You don't have to tell me how you solved for it. I need to see the KSP expression, your equation that you plugged in, and then you state your X. Um, so two or three sig figs, or again, if you're Kobe, you can give me your eight. He does it so beautifully. So um, moles per liter. And then we go, there are how many nitrogens in that compound? Six. So when you figure out you have one copper and six nitrogens. All right, uh, 147.6 grams per mole or 0.55, however you like to do it. Um, and then I did give you a volume. Uh, you can either, hopefully you've now gotten used to changing liters to milliliters. So times the 0.5 liters. Uh, you, if you if you stopped at that point, on my thing it says how many grams. Um, so I got 0 0.040 grams, which I would say change it to a metric unit, which means let's get rid of the place value. So you could pick, I would go to milligrams, so 40 milligrams. You could also do four centigrams. All right, so that's finding solubility. Any questions? We'll just keep going. So the common ion effect, it showed up in buffers and I ignored it. I mentioned it and said I would talk about it this week and here we are in this week. Uh, so it's important with this. It, it was in buffers. It, buffers work because they have a common ion. That's really the point with buffers. So buffers work because you always have like a week with its conjugate. So they have to have an ion in common. Um, so the common ion effect is if you add something that has an ion in common with, with what we're working with in the test tube, the calcium fluoride or the copper azide, uh, you're going to change the solubility. So this is saying we have PbCl2. So let's start by writing our equation. Whenever you write the equation, you write the solid first. It's the exact opposite of how we taught you in 221, where we showed how you made the precipitate. We're just always saying, okay, we have a solid and a wee bit of it is gonna ionize. Lead is called one of the heavy metals. Lead, silver, and mercury, they precipitate 
pretty much with everything. I don't know why those three. Um, the, the metals are classified actually different than on the periodic table by how they precipitate. And, and we get to that, the last three labs are kind of special and were really fun to do in person. You get to watch me do them on a video and then you get to do something fun with it. Um, all right, so we want that. We're gonna use, this is all about Le Chatelier's principle. You guys remember him? The system is at equilibrium. We have solid, we have aqueous. So this side is my precipitate. And this side is aqueous, soluble, dissolves. KSP tells you what again? How much is dissolved? Why? You're right. Because you don't include what state of matter. We don't include, we don't include solid. We're only looking at how much dissolves. All right. So common ion effect, sodium chloride. What did I tell you about sodium at the very beginning? Like sodium. It was. It was this. They're always ions, aqueous. The ones they're always aqueous. Whenever you see that means it's always a spectator. Whenever you see sodium, cross it out. It's not going to have any impact. Chloride does so. How does chloride affect this whole thing? The Chatelet's principle. So I have a solution that has lead chloride in it. We have some precipitate. To be at equilibrium, everything is present. So there is some solid precipitate. It looks like a snow globe. It looks like that picture on the front page. And there are ions. You just can't see the ions unless you have squid eyes. And now I dump some table salt in there, some sodium chloride. The sodium is just going to keep swimming around. It's not interested in anything. But according to Le Chatelier, if you increase the chloride, which is a product, what's going to happen? It's going to shift. Here's my chloride. It's going to shift reverse. So you're going to get more precipitate. That's all I'm looking for. So with the next one, what's going to happen? First of all, what's the spectator? When, when I add the lead nitrate, what's the spectator? The nitrate. Uh, Nick the camel, Nick nitrate. You guys don't remember me teaching you that? All right, nitrate's the spectator. And go ahead, Major, were you going to answer that? Uh, I was going to say it was going to shift um, forward because the, the no. lead would go up. Lead goes up, but lead's a product also. So it's the same answer. So as we increase the PB, but PB is the ion, it's a product. So which way is it going to shift? Reverse. So the common ion effect is if you add one of these ions, you're going to shift reverse and you get precipitate. So it's actually kind of cool because, um, yeah. All right, on C, what happens and why? Uh, nothing because K is one of the standbys and uh, NO is also, wait. Yeah, so both K and I are always spectators or the other way you can answer it is there's no common ion. On our handout, we have KNO3. Yeah, we have NO3. That's great, KNO3. 
that would be much better question. I was going to have to make my disclaimer. Thank you. So there's no common ion. You can also say actually how Paul answered that, that um, potassium and nitrate are always spectators. They, that means they're never interested. It was a question on that very first lab, the Le Chatelier's lab. So the potassium nitrate are always spectators. There are again, several others that are always spectators, but if those four that I gave us will get us through this, I'm pretty sure, unless we run into one of them. All right, so. Ki, on your sheet you have Ki, it would still have no change because there's no common ion. Is that what you're saying? No, it's a terrible question. Okay. Uh, because lead, lead is a heavy metal and it would form a new precipitate with the iodide. And so then it runs into a preferential equilibrium. And that's a question that we run into on Wednesday, which is which precipitate forms. And I'll teach you how to do it on Wednesday. That's why I had to change the question. I didn't realize. Um, I picked KI, because Major knows this, because he's been in my classroom. I, I uh, got my classroom like police taped off 10 years ago at our final. Um, and we were not going to be allowed to take our final in the classroom. And I had to go in and stand up for my class because somebody did a demo that went really well. And I have a video of it on my computer. Um, anyway, the one guy is, is a doctor now. He's in his third year of residency. Um, and it was with KI. And it was like, uh, I was like grading stuff and ignoring my phone. And then it was like, hi, this is public safety. There's There's a problem with classroom 1303. So Major knows the story because the first day you come in the classroom, there's this big stain on the ceiling. The whole moral of the story actually is because the next term, my classroom got closed down again and I got a, an email and I went, I know all the, the custodians and stuff. And I went to one of them and said, is there a new person cleaning my classroom? And they said, oh yeah, there is. And I said, and it's a female. And they're like, yeah. Cause I was like, guys aren't going to care. If guys see a mess, they're going to be like, I'll leave it for like, who looks at the ceiling? I mean, then it's a really high ceiling. Um, and so that's how I found out that after 20 years or whatever, 15 years, somebody new was cleaning. All right, let's move on. Distraction. So that's why KI was showing up because it was a joke with the class. So iodine leaves a black stain. It was uh, elephant's toothpaste. So actually, this is a good segue for a moment. You guys have presentations tomorrow, which are the chemist presentations, and then you're going to be doing a demo. So let's worry about tomorrow, but I'll be talking about more on Wednesday um, that you can Google like chemistry demos that you can do at home or chemistry experiments, and then we'll talk about it so you can make it bigger. Last year, everybody wanted to do elephant's toothpaste, but only one person gets to. Um, all right, we start by writing our equation. So it's just silver chloride. So we do silver plus chloride. State your KSP expression. This is not 4X cubed. This is just gonna be X and X. This one's pretty simple. So the KSP is gonna equal the silver ion always showing ion, chloride ion. And so we look up the KSP in the chart, which your teacher should be 1.8 um, times 10 to negative 10 equals X squared. And we solve for X. And did I want to know how much dissolves? We're just going to move on. 1.34 e to the negative 5. That would be moles per liter. If you want all the way to grams, in case you get bored, somebody's really fast at math, you would get 1.9 milligrams. Let's put it there. That's just kind of a checkpoint. You guys know how to change moles to grams to milligrams. So now we're gonna do it again. It's the same equation, 
So write your equation again. It's going to feel redundant writing it again, but just do it. The students who do it end up doing great and getting done twice as fast because you're just looking at it. This is not an x squared question. This, we ignore the sodium. That is how much chloride I have. The only unknown is the silver. So now technically, this is how we're gonna do it. Technically, and if somebody wants to and prove that it really doesn't make a difference, technically this is zero. And then we're doing a plus X and a plus X. X is gonna be so small that we're gonna ignore it. So you basically just say this is X and this is 0.1 because the amount of that you're going to have. So we plug into our KSP, right? Our KSP is still silver times chloride. And the silver is my only unknown now. And the chloride is 0.1. Again, technically it's 0.1 plus X, but that's not going to make any difference in our answers, so we ignore it. KSP is still the same KSP, 1.8 e to negative 10. You solve for X, which is 1.8 e to negative 9. That's moles per liter. The silver is, this is technically silver. A step, if, if we were going to show this fully and perfectly right, for every one mole of silver ion, there is one mole of silver chloride. And then you could do your mole to grams of your silver chloride. I mentioned this because at some point that's going to be important. It might not be a one-to-one -one ratio, but it, I, I alluded to it earlier because I wanted, but we can see if the silver, everything's one, whatever I get for the silver, that is my silver chloride. But that is why it's a one-to-one -one mole ratio. Um, and then we'd figure out our grams and so on. Uh, and you guys, well, it is silver. I always use the periodic table to one or two decimal places because Otherwise, you end up rounding enough. And that might be why all of you who are working on your worksheet earlier had a slightly different number than me. Not all of you. All of you but one. Anyway, you get an answer. I ended up going to micrograms. Um, how mine is worded, I, I just said how much dissolves. I will actually say solve in grams. Um, I got that it's 26 micrograms. It's a much smaller number. And then I would ask, sorry, that's MCG, it got cut off. Um, why does that answer make sense? Because it's what we were doing up here. We added a common ion. It shifted the reaction reverse. Now, how I wrote it up above, I said that there was more precipitate. A better way to answer it, though, is less dissolves. Because KSP is all about the aqueous, because it's a K. Ks are aqueous and gases. And so much less dissolves. 
we went from milligrams to micrograms. All right. Questions. So we're going to do calcium fluoride. You can take a break or you can read about the magical flowers or uh, powers of fluoride. Or you can try the problem. I'm going to pause. So calcium fluoride is fluorite. And I, I have some. But uh, for those of you who are into fluorite, it does relieve stress. It's beautiful. It usually has a greenish hue, but there's all different colors you can find of it. Um, yeah. And has lots of spiritual qualities. We'll say that S word here. Um, state your formula, write your KSP. And I tend to write them next to each other, what I was trying to say on the first page, and then I do the math underneath. This one doesn't require lots of math. Again, in your KSP expression, the two is going to go up here. And all we know, it's just saying how much dissolves. It doesn't give you anything else other than fun facts. So this is just a 4x cubed problem. You have to look up your KSP, maybe. Oh, I gave it to you somewhere. No, you, I don't know. 3.9 e to negative 11, hopefully, is what was in yours. So that's your setup. And again, the KSPs are in that chart. Um, so X is 2.14 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter. And you would go through going all the way to grams. You should get 0 0.0167 grams per liter. You would show me those steps. Appropriate metric unit, anybody? Oh, I gave you an answer, so that I can move it two or three. So I can either go to centigrams or grams. So 16. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not per liter. That's just, is it? Because I gave you, is that the answer? I think my answer is wrong. They may do it. Uh, no, that's not the answer. It's half that. Yes. It's it's 8.35 milligrams. Well, or 0 0.008315. So you would get 0 0.00835 grams. And then that's what I mean by appropriate metric prefix is we're trying to get rid of the zeros. So we'd want to move it three places, which is milli. 1,000, so 8.35 milligrams. And I probably gave you the, I don't know what I gave you the answer. Um, all right, so uh, now, uh, said, go ahead. Probably, probably a question. I know you just said that where we got that quote from, but where did you get it from again? The four X cubed? It's X and two X. So I'm gonna have X, the two and the x are both squared. So two squared is the four. Oh, so this is four x squared times the x. So it always comes out as a four x cubed when it's like this. Does that make sense? Maybe. It's a really good question. That's only true though. Important question that, that um, Major just asked. That's only true when we, all we have is calcium fluoride. So they're stoichiometrically related, the X. This one, it's, oh, there's my equation. That's part of that. Uh, this one's different though, because I give you the amount of calcium. And I know it's the amount of calcium because that's the common ion. Nitrates, again, you're going to always cross out sodiums and nitrates. Uh, so this 0 0.01 and a comment that somebody made last week, and I want to make it for all of you, be careful about your zeros. 
So sometimes it's 0.1, sometimes it's 0 0.01. So it's 0 0.01, however you write that. And this is X. This is the most asked question for the next week. Why is it not 2X? So maybe I'll ask that question. Why is it only X and not 2X here? Because we know the calcium. Since you know the calcium, the other one is your only unknown is just the fluoride. All right. Um, this one's a nicer question. So we'll set up our KSP. Not, I don't know if my answer is correct, but we'll find out. Um, So if you know the one, the other one is just X. It's 2X when we're stoichiometrically relating it. But since my only unknown is the fluoride, fluoride is X. We solve for X and I don't have an answer. Um, You're showing your work. If you solved it as 2x, you would lose like, well, it would depend, maybe a point. Um, but again, it is just x. So when we solve for x, I got 6.24 e to the negative 5. That's moles per liter. And that is of your fluoride. We're trying to find grams of calcium fluoride. So there are two moles of fluoride for every one mole of calcium fluoride. And then we'd have to change our, oh, oh, one mole of calcium fluoride is like around 78.1 grams. And then we're going to go to milligrams just for the heck of it. Uh, one gram, if you do it as a thousand, it would be a thousand milligrams on top. If you do it the other way, you do one milligram over 10 to negative three grams. And let me punch it in and see if I got my answer right. Two point four. Oh, it's like before, my answer is, oh, and then are we in 500 mils? Sorry. So times 0.5 liters. So I got one point, oh, I got this one right, 1.22 milligrams. You can ponder that one. That one's always the hardest one. All right, for C, it's a similar idea. We state our equation. Is this, did you guys have a C and a D or no? You do? All right. Um, this time we know the fluoride. Calcium is my X. So we don't double this. This is just what it is. And in all honesty, this is probably the hardest thing that we do is this idea that if you know the one, the other one's just what it is. There's no stoichiometric relation in our table. Um, Yeah. 
You would rearrange and salt, right? This is X. You do still square the 0.01. Our KSP is still the same number. So we find X is 3.9, E to the negative 7. This would be moles of calcium per liter. This one's a 1 to 1 mole ratio. But you're always going back to the precipitate because the sodium doesn't matter. I guess the other thing I want to emphasize, because a number of you made it this far to me without having to show work, apparently, in your other chemistry classes. And so you're having to show your work here, which means you need to label things. So most of you are labeling well, but just to emphasize that that's, this is important. So we want to label all these pieces. Um, That's my math and oh, we're gonna have the point, the 500, assuming I gave you guys the 500 milliliters too. So 0.5 liters. So my liters cancel, my moles cancel, and I would be at grams. Um, if you want, you can show your milligram step two. Sorry, I would see if my answer is right. I think I changed the question. No. All right. At this point, if you want, you would get 1.53 e to the negative 5. This is grams. And so when I see 10 to the negative 5, I think micrograms. So just a reminder, a microgram I write it as MCG because otherwise people ask me what my funny symbol is, uh, is 10 to the negative 6 grams. So it comes out as 15 micrograms. That's the symbol. It's a mu. It's that funky. Uh, most people in medicine now say MCG so that they don't, that's a thousand fold difference or a hundred fold in this case. Uh, but does the answer make sense that if we add a common ion, you're going to decrease the solubility, less dissolves. Decreasing solubility means less dissolves. So our common ion was either the fluoride or the calcium. Um, questions? We get to compare solubilities. This is perfect because the Olympics are the Olympics still going on. I don't even know. I'm fascinated because the Olympics have been going on. They keep showing like all these people playing with no masks on, and you go to the store and everybody's starting to wear masks again. And I'm like, this is this is fascinating. So, all right. Uh, so comparing. KSP is given. Which one of these is the most soluble and why? You really have a 50-50 chance. It's not going to be the monkey in the middle, right? He's going to be in the middle. Is it going to be the first one? It's going to be the last one. <laughs> So KSP tells you how much dissolves. KSP is how soluble. So the higher the KSP, the more soluble. So that's why it's the silver chloride. So we're dealing with negative exponents. 
it's like with the KAs and stuff. So the lower the KSP is going to be the least soluble or most precipitate. which would have been the silver iodide. So you want to be careful with KSPs. Now, there's a little note here that you can't do this. You can only do this. It worked on this one without doing math because they were, they were the same ion ratio, meaning one to one, that these would all be X squared, X squared, X squared. I can't do that here. Because this, if we wrote out our KSP expression, this one is silver and chloride, right? We just have one of each. But this one, I have two silvers and one chromate. Back to the question Major asked. This one is a one-to-one -one ratio. This is an X squared problem. For sol X is solubility. This silver chromate is like the calcium fluoride. It's going to be an X and a 2X. So this is a 4X cubed problem. And so if you have different number of ions, you can't simply compare KSPs. If you solve for X, you get 1.3. I'm just going to jump to it. E to negative 5. And on this one, apparently we get 1.3 e to negative 4. So X is how soluble? So the silver chromate is more soluble. There's three ions packing into this KSP expression as opposed to only two. Um, so that's why you can't just look at KSP, often have to solve the problem. You just have to go to moles per liter. All right, questions with that. The other comment here is I kind of emphasize, please be careful. Sometimes I ask which is most soluble, like I did on this page. And sometimes I ask which precipitates first. I, I, I don't know which one I ask. It's just like whatever I end up typing and who knows what mode my brain is in at that moment. So just be careful because the answer is opposite. So one of them is always the most soluble and then the least soluble precipitates first. Um, so most precipitate or precipitates first would have been the silver iodide. Right. Questions? We're not going to go for, we're going to go for like another 10, 15 minutes. I think we can do, we're not, we're going to say the complex ions. Is your next page simultaneous equilibrium? I'm pretty sure. All right. I want to show these because these are pretty cool. Um, does it have this there to write the equation for lead to chloride? Yeah, this looks the same. I do this. Okay, so let's go ahead and do it. So a solution means aqueous. And we know it's aqueous because the potassium's there. So does anybody know the formula for chromate without like Googling it? And Major will beat all of you. His Googling skills are phenomenal. Right. CR04. <laughs> As negative two, he is. He's faster than I can even get the question out sometimes. So it's K2CRO4. So chromate, that's chromate. It's a negative two. Chromates precipitate with everything except the sodium, potassium. Uh, chromate's really useful in the lab as an oxidizing agent. We get to oxidation reduction next week. All right. And it's added, which means plus. Uh, to a solid. So PB, uh, the lead is going to be a two charge and the chloride's a minus one. So PBCl2 is a solid. 
right? It's a double displacement reaction. We're going to go ahead, though, and write our equation with two arrows because I don't know which way it's going to go without looking at my notes. What are the products? Remember how they switch their partners? They switch ions. So the potassium is going to now be with? Chloride. Chloride. Just one of each because they each have a one charge. The twos that we saw there are going to go going to end up with two potassium chlorides. So we don't want to say K2Cl2. We want to say two KCLs. Uh, and then the lead goes with the chromate. And a reminder, always the cation. The metal is shown first and then the nonmetal. Uh, they each have negative, I'm sorry, they each have a two charge because that's just what chromate is. So CrO4 is our, um, there we go. And so that's our double displacement. That's writing our equation. That's balanced. What is missing from my equation though? Missing from the product. Equations balanced, all the ions are there. Dates of matter. Dates of matter. So KCL, what's it going to be? And why? Aqueous, because it has K in it. Potassium. Aqueous, because it has potassium. So potassium, sodium, nitrate, those are always going to be aqueous. And this is going to be a solid. Why? It's a heavy metal. Yeah, those heavy metals, lead, I mean, it's a neurotoxin, but it's so bad because it's always precipitating with everything. But um, you could also look in the chart in the back and lead has this huge list of what it precipitates with. Lead, silver, and mercury are huge. Uh, we're balanced because the two subscripts here became a two in front. All right. Now, back in the good old days, you would, anything that was aqueous, we would split into ions. And then we cross out the spectators. But we're going to do it the shortcut way. What's our spectator ion? Because it's always a spectator ion. Max already answered this. Go ahead, Paul. OK. OK. I'm assuming you weren't asking the question, K. So potassium is a spectator. We're going to ignore it. It was nice to write our equation. But you may have noticed most equations have been written without, as showing without the sodiums and potassiums. Um, it often drives students crazy back when it starts happening in 221. So we leave the K out, the two Ks. Um, and so this would be chromate as an ion. You, you can show the aqueous, but you have to show the charge because PBCL2 is a solid. So we respect that, it's just PBCL2. And we end up with here, the K again is going to cancel. The two stays there because we have two chloride ions. And we have another precipitate. So it's a shortcut way of getting to a net ionic. What you're going to see when you see the question asked is going to be like how it is on number two. See how it's written like that? It's just showing ions. It's leaving out what was with the sodium, or I'm sorry, what was with the chloride and the iodide. It was probably potassium or sodium. It doesn't matter. It's a spectator. It's never going to precipitate. So what we're going to do now is we're going to write the half reactions. And we do this a lot over the next couple of weeks. We only have a couple of weeks left. You don't don't flip anything so pull out your solid so the this one the solids on the product side and here my solid the pbcl2 is on the reactant side so the solid you only have one solid in each half reaction that's what i was trying to say now write what ions they go to so to make the pbcro4 we need lead ion and chromate. We're showing them as ions. 
and they are aqueous. So if that helps you, you can write the aqueous or you can leave the aqueous off. Um, I mentioned that at the very beginning, you're going to see me leave the aqueous off because you have to show the charge. If you're showing a charge of an ion, it's telling us it's aqueous. All right, solid, we always show, and this is going to PB plus 2CO negative. These are aqueous. So those are half reactions. That's really what's going on is the lead and the chromate are hooking up and making lead chromate, and the lead chloride solid is breaking apart into lead and chloride ions. It doesn't matter which half reaction you write first and second, they're ha happening at the same time. So which one is written correctly for KSP? The second one. The second one, why? I just like, I don't know why. <laughs> is it the solid going to aqueous? All right. So we go to the chart. We find lead chloride. You know what? I have a chart here. I think it's 1.8 e to negative 5. Right. We go to our chart. We find lead in the chart. We find the lead chloride. And... 1.7 e to negative 5. Having a ruler and another piece of paper is helpful with these charts. All right, that's 1.7 e to negative 5. Now, lead chromate also has a number. It's right underneath it. 1.8 e to negative 14. However, if my equation flipped, what do I do to the K value? For a negative one. Yes. So this whole thing gets flipped. Either you have to say one over it or you take it to the negative one. And then what do you do when you add up the two equations? That was our overall equation. What do we do to the two K values now? Multiply them together multiply them. Another way of saying it is we have the KSP for the PBCL2, and we're going to divide it by the KSP of the one that flipped the PBCR04. Or you can say this is a negative one times that. Now, I have no idea what the answer is. I have never punched this one in. Without punching it in your calculator, Somebody already has, so don't answer, but we can play along. We basically have 1.7 e to negative 5 on top and 1.8 e to negative 14 in the denominator. Is the answer larger or less than 1? That's actually all we care about. I'm dividing, it's larger than 1. This, this is good math skills from back in whatever class you would have learned this back way back you're dividing by a smaller number so our k value our k net sorry um is going to be greater than one whatever it comes out to you can always punch it in if k is greater than one what does that mean i guess i can do it down here so our k net is greater than one k greater than one means Product favored? Yeah, it's product favored. So which, which precipitate formed? The lead chromate, because that's on the, so PBCRO4 is the precipitate, because that's my product. So it's another way of doing what we did on the previous page. Instead of like comparing them as a list, it's saying here it is, which solid forms. So write your two half reactions. Keep the solids on whatever side it is. Write your KSP. One of the KSPs is going to flip. Find your K net. You're going to pause us. Give you a minute to try it. 
All right. I had a note to myself I was going to do something different, but we'll solve this. I'm going to come back over this on Wednesday. If you did it, great. We're going to do this on Wednesday, the complex ions. So I want to mention we're not going to finish the notes today. We're going to finish in five minutes. There are in the week 3B folder, uh, these are called complex ions, sorry. And they're in the week 3B folder. If we will probably start these notes on Wednesday so that we, we might even finish them because they're not too bad. Um, but they go with what we're going to talk about down here or an explanation of them. I have a note to myself that I wanted to talk about pH. Um, I, I'll talk about this part up here, all these words, but it is because you have a question in your study set. Um, and so I'm going to go through this kind of fast, but in the study set for Wednesday, that has a hydroxide. And the trick again, always you start with your solids. This is is this on your notes, magnesium hydroxide, right? Assuming, otherwise Captain America would help me along. Um, you write your expression. If all you're asked is what's the solubility, you just say, well, this must be X and this is two X because you don't know anything else. You write your KSP, you solve for X. And then you see what units I want. All right, that, if that's all you know, that's what you do. I mean, look at B. So it's magnesium hydroxide. And a quick comment. For some of you, it may help to write the OH in parentheses so you don't think it's a 20. All right, this is not an X and a 2X. We know one of them. Which one do we know and why? If you're given pH. We know hydroxide because we can solve for its concentration using pOH. So using the pOH. The yeah, 10 to the negative pOH is your hydroxide. So if pH is 10, I'm pretty sure you all got that pOH then will be four. Um, so this is gonna be 10 to negative four. Now on this one, cause I'm asking what's the solubility, magnesium is X and the hydroxide is 10 to minus four. So if however, the question and this is what happens in your study set. And so I want you to ponder this. Um, if you're given a mass, and we'll see this, we'll, we'll actually go through the notes on Wednesday before your study sets do. So if you're having trouble getting to an answer, just put a star. And by the time we get through the notes Wednesday, it will start to click. But, but working on it can help. Um, how much you add doesn't matter. How much dissolves does matter. So there's a difference. So how much somebody dumps, you can dump however much you want into a container. That doesn't matter in this problem solving. What matters is how much dissolves. pH is telling you how much hydroxide you have because you can always change it to pOH. If it, um, yeah, so we'll leave it, we'll leave it with that. I want to show you one other, just because some of you like to go. Let's just do the first one. Let's try and decide which one I wanted to do. This is great news because it's a Q problem. Um, 
So there's more than one way to solve this problem. If you see a question where it doesn't ask how much, how much dissolves, how soluble, how much precipitates, find the value of KSP, it's not really asking for a number, it's just saying a yes, no, what happens? Q is actually the easiest thing to do. Um, and so I want to show you how, and there is other ways to solve this, but they require a little bit more thinking. So I want to show you this with Q. Now the studies that that's due Wednesday, not until six o'clock Wednesday, again, Tuesday, what is due Tuesday is most of you are doing your presentations on Tuesday during the regular class time. Those of you presenting today, you get Tuesday off. Um, your papers are due by midnight Tuesday. You do have a seven day challenge lab, the bufferosis that uh, you may be finishing today or tomorrow and that's due Tuesday. So you kind of get this chance to catch up. Um, and those of you who like to get a step ahead, um, the, the Wednesday, there's another week three folder that has the Wednesday, Thursday study sets. So it tells us you dissolve this much. So that's good because it's how much dissolved. It's not saying you added this much. It's saying, hey, this is how much dissolved. So what we'd want to do is we'd change our two milligrams of silver chloride in 500 milliliters to what unit? Molarity. Molarity. We want to go to moles per liter. And we can do that little trick where we cross out the milli and the milli. So we don't have to deal with metric. So we just have to figure out, and your teacher already did that. Uh, this is like 143.5 grams to one mole. And that gives us, all right, really? All right, 2.8, when we punch that in, 2.8 e to the negative five is our molarity of the silver chloride. Now, what was the step I should have done first? Because if you're like me and you're like, oh, I just want to punch it all in my calculator. I have numbers. What's the first thing you're always supposed to do with KSPs? Write the uh, formula. Write, write the formula. Teacher keeps taking it down. Um, write your balance equation. Silver, chloride, solid. Silver plus chloride. Right? And write your KSP expression. These are both going to be equal. But rather than solving for X, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, did it dissolve? Did it really dissolve? Let's see. So if you see this question, will precipitate form, it's a Q problem. Q is set up just like K, so we just look at the ions, and we're going to plug that number in, the 2.8 e to the negative 5. I'm going to plug it into each of them, so I just square it, and I get a number. I get 7.8 e to the negative 10. So here we go. What do I do now? If this is Q, and the reason is it's not worded, it's not worded correctly. This should say you added this amount. We don't know if it all dissolved yet. And, and so I apologize. I should have found that typo on there. So Q is telling me this is ideal. We compare Q to K. So if you remember your alphabet, can't remember who did their alphabet backwards, but we put them in alphabetical order. This is Q, 7.8 e to negative 10. Where do I find K? In that appendix. I look up silver chloride and is it silver chloride? 1.8 
e to negative 10. Just showing you different ways to do it. If all you got from today, and that's usually what students tell me, they're like, oh my God, I'm so lost. I don't miss that part of being in person where everybody's like the deer in the headlights. If the only thing you got from today is that you're like, okay, you go solid to ions and how to write your expression. Like I said, you're 90% of the way there. I compare these two numbers. The Q is larger. All right, so my question was, will a precipitate form? If K is smaller than Q, what's gonna happen? The reaction's gonna move, which way? Towards the reactant? Yeah, the, as long as you know how to write your this correctly, if you put it in alphabetical order, the nose points you in the direction. It's gonna go reverse. So does a precipitate form? Yes. Because the precipitate's on that side. So did it all dissolve? No. If it asked us how much dissolved or how much precipitated, we would solve it different. But Q gives us the yes, no. So uh, yes, precipitate because it's shifted that way. It's shifted in the reverse direction towards the solid. Um, and again, we'll go through these, finish the notes, and we'll possibly, depending how Wednesday goes, start on the complex ions, which are in the week 3B folder. Um, all right. And I look forward to all your presentations.